Welcome to Watchmen on the Wall, a daily outreach of Southwest Radio Ministries and SWRC.com. God is still on the throne, and prayer changes things. Today is Patriots Day in the United States, and we have Ministry President Dr. Kenneth Hill and our host Dr. Larry Spargimino here to discuss this important day's significance. Our biggest event of the year is almost here. Prophecy in the News Live comes to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania for three full days, October 17th through the 19th. Is America in Bible prophecy? How can we be victorious in spiritual war? Do ancient secret societies still exist? What is unicorn Bible archaeology? Discover the answers with a dozen nationally known speakers and Bible teachers. Visit the events page of our website and register today. SWRC.com and click on Events. VIP packages are available with special meal and hotel packages. Prophecy in the News Live Gettysburg, October 17th through the 19th. Register today by calling 1-800-652-1144 or visit the events page of swrc.com. And now here's ministry president, Dr. Kenneth Hill. God is still on the throne and prayer changes things. Hi there, this is Kenneth Hill, and I am delighted to be in the studio today, and I get to talk to one of the guys that I think is the very best in doing the job that he does in keeping us informed. I enjoy everything he writes, and I enjoy everything he teaches. His name is Larry Spargimino. Mm -hmm. Dr. Spargimino, welcome to your microphone. And I'm delighted to be here as president of SWRC. And we're here to talk specifically about the day that has lived in infamy since September 11th, 2001. Well, it's my privilege, uh, Kenneth, to be back with you. You are my radio mentor, radio and TV, and I learned so much from you, and God put us as neighbors in Bluff City for several years. Radio is so exciting. Television is so exciting. It's opened up many vistas, many new adventures. So thank you so much, dear brother. Oh, it was my pleasure, and if it hadn't been for your dear sweet wife, (laughs) <laughs> yes. <laughs> and what what a promotional vehicle she was for you. <laughs> she mm, was wonderful. I remember. We yeah. had a great time. And you have been uh, soldiering on there at Southwest for how many years now? I think it's about 25. Going on 25. Yeah, that's about, that's about correct. About a quarter of a century. And I'm so excited. I'll be 83 in October, but I'm as excited as ever before. So praise the Lord (laughs) for the wonderful opportunities and for the challenges that our our world is facing. What a a privilege to be able to address so many current issues in the light of the Scripture, God's holy word. So it's just, uh, that's rough. That's what I want to do. Well, it's exciting because we get to live in this time. It is a challenge, and it will be a challenge going forth, but God is taking care of us even in the midst of trouble, and we're wanting to talk about those kinds of things today of what's going on, what has gone on, and what we expect to go on rather soon. Let me ask you the question. On September 11th, 2001, where were you when you found out we were under attack. Oh, that's an interesting story. Well, on that Tuesday, I was leading devotions at Southwest Radio Church. We were in the Gospel of John, chapter 11. I was using my defined study Bible, Dr. Waite's Bible, and I have a big mark there and a little note. We were in uh, chapter 11, and a little after 9 a.m., Yvonne Williams, you remember Yvonne, She worked in the watch room. She ran into the conference room where we were gathered. She was out of breath, and I knew something exciting was going on. And she said, we are under attack. Turn on the television. So (laughs) 
I was right in the middle of it and left a big impression on me. As a result of that, I became very interested in martyrdom in radical Islam. And I found out a lot because there had been earlier explosions and suicide bombings. And I found out that in radical Islam, no one can ever be sure that they're going to their heaven. So your good deeds have to outweigh your bad deeds. But you know, it's pretty hard to keep track. How can you know that your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds? You can never have assurance. There's only one way, and that is to die as a martyr. Kenneth, the evening before, those men were doing everything that was sinful in their religion. They were looking at porn, 19 men. They were drinking beer, all bad things, according to Islam. But they believed that the next day, their sins would be washed away. I was able to pick up some of Osama bin Laden's recruitment material. And he says something like this. With the first gush of your blood, you were sent to paradise with the wine, the virgins, the clean sheets, and I won't go any further. I was right in the middle of it. There were those four coordinated suicide attacks involving 19 terrorists. They hijacked four commercial airliners. The hijackers crashed the first two planes into the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center in New York City. And of course, I was born there and lived there almost 30 years. As it unfolded, the next two planes were aimed at targets uh, in or near Washington, D.C. That was an attack on America's capital. The third team struck the Pentagon, the head of our military. The fourth plane crashed in rural Pennsylvania during a passenger revolt. What, What brave souls they were. These attacks, of course, touched off a lot of discussion. Is Islam a terrorist religion or not? I have to point out that not all Muslims are terrorists. Many of them are searching, and I know a few. And it's really exciting to see them warm up to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But, of course, there are some things, certain facets of Islam, that tend to terrorism. I remember that was a very important day for me, and it launched me on a study of radical Islam, and then by the grace of God, the Lord sent me to Pakistan, done a work there, great group there, so it's been a real adventure, but something that is a great concern to my heart, it's a very real danger. Indeed it is, and we we have been seeing over the years changes in our own society. We have a number of people that have just basically given themselves over to the kinds of things that cause us great harm as people. It's Mm -hmm. amazing to us that growing up in Northeast Tennessee, as I did, in the backwoods, as it were, I had no idea that there were so many people who took the name of Islam as their religion. It's been amazing to me to watch in our society as we have done our best with the help of CARE and other organizations, we have done our best to give our society over to Islam. Yes, yes, so that's, that's very true. One thing that I'm very excited about is the fact there is a lot of Muslim evangelism going on at the present time. And I'm excited about that. There are Muslims who are coming to Christ. I know several from Pakistan. In my book, The Abraham Proclamation, I relay some information about Dr. R.T. Kendall. He is the former pastor of Westminster Chapel in London, where Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones pastored for many years. And Kendall actually had several meetings with Yasser Arafat, believe it or not. Now, we don't know if Arafat's in heaven or not, and I don't want to say he is. He heard the gospel, and uh, there are many other Palestinians who have heard the gospel. And you know, Ken, it was uh, very interesting. A couple of weeks ago, when I was speaking at our conference in Minnesota, I relayed that story of Dr. Kendall and Chairman Arafat, and how Mr. Arafat's 
right-hand man said, stop it, Dr. Kendall, you're trying to proselytize Chairman Arafat. And Mr. Arafat says, no, 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 I want to hear what he has to say. After I shared that at the conference in Minnesota, a woman came up to me and said she had another story that she had gotten firsthand about Arafat, his staff, and the gospel. Well, Arafat, several years ago, was looking for someone to teach his staff English. And this woman, who was over a gospel outreach, knew a person who taught ESL, English as a second language, to Arabic-speaking people. So this woman said she would teach Arafat and his staff English using the Bible. (laughs) Well, of course, uh, Arafat said, absolutely not. And so this, this woman declined. And after about two days, Arafat called her. He had changed his mind, a Christian lady who used the Bible. And of course, we know the son of Hamas, what a wonderful soul he is, very, very dedicated Christian serving the Lord and telling the truth about the Palestinians that, uh, you, you know, this is Jewish land and so forth. I always like to look at the positive side. There is a positive side. There are many Muslims who are saying, is this what I really want for my family? Do I have to be a terrorist to be a good Muslim? And usually the answer is, yeah, you've got to be a terrorist. And so when they hear about Jesus and about his love, when somebody gives them a scripture, John fourteen six, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. That really hits them hard. I certainly want to pray for the the Muslims, men and women, who are coming to Christ at the present time. Indeed. Your book, The Abraham Proclamation, tell me a little bit more about your book, and then let's continue with our conversation. Okay, well, as you know, we spent several couple of weeks in Israel last year filming working together with Matthew and all the others, the attack of October the 7th and all of the claims from pro-Hamas supporters that the land from the river to the sea belongs to the Palestinians, I wrote a book dealing with that. I deal with the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis chapter 15, looked at history, looked at the land of Israel. Is it really Palestinian? Is there an ancient Palestinian culture with archaeological pottery and runes going back 1,500 years? Well, of course, there's none of that at all. So I do a thorough study on that and deal with a lot of related issues. And another one is, of course, replacement theology, the idea that the church has replaced Israel and has uh, inherited all of Israel's promises. That is so wrong, and I'm so upset that there are so many Christians who are following that line of thought. I deal with that issue. I deal with the land issue. I also speak about Muslim evangelism. It's really an exciting book for me because it's very current and very on target. So many people only look at CNN. Well, they need to read a lot of the stuff that we produce. Larry Stamm is a dear a messianic brother. We've got a lot of good stuff going on out there, and I think this book will be really helpful to anyone who reads it, the Abraham Proclamation. Well, Pastor Larry, thank you for letting me know a little bit more about your book. I've not had the opportunity to read that one, and I'm looking forward to getting it. I'm going to have to order it from swrc.com. That's what I will do. I want to say thank you for giving us the first conversation that we're having, and I want to continue with that if I could. What else has the Lord laid upon your heart as it pertains to today? Well, there are several things. I'm really burdened about Marxism. Marxism has become so strong in America. So many of the things that are happening, the protests, the demonstrations, the BLM, Black Lives Matter movement, goes back to Marxism. I found that 
Marxism and its many descendants has infiltrated many countries and regions with disastrous effects. Marxism is uh, systemically anti-God and has led to the persecution of Christians, to national upheavals and violent revolutions. Now, I did a lot of study. I went back to Rousseau, who preceded Marx. He taught that human beings were basically good. It was society that corrupts them. Now, Marx actually built his whole idea on this thesis. Marx taught that man is indeed good, but capitalism corrupts him. He believed that human nature could be changed if society changed, if people own nothing, but still had their needs met, they would live in harmony. In this scheme, man is not the problem. Capitalism is. And of course, this is another example of blame shifting, Genesis 3. The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Capitalism has become the scapegoat for those who refuse to blame themselves for their problems and for the problems that plague humanity. It's very attractive, but this kind of thinking is the juicy worm that covers the barbed hook. Once impaled, escape is very, very difficult, and we see so much of that going on in the world. Marxism has the definite disdain for the family, and we know that the family is under attack. Well, Marx believed that the traditional family was a threat to the implementation of his socialist agenda. Families tend to pass along their wealth to their children, thereby perpetuating what Marx considered inequality. Families and family obligations are associated with the Judeo-Christian religion, which, of course, Marx was against. The command against adultery and the demands of a monogamous relationship do not fit into the Marxist idea of a happy people. So it is therefore strange, not strange, that those who delight in, quote, casual sex would feel very comfortable in a Marxist world. And I said, wow, all, all these things are, are coming together. And actually, Marx said some things about the family. He believed that the family was one of the main instruments of oppression. You know, he believed that men oppressed their wives, parents oppressed their children, and took them to church. And God was the ultimate oppressor, according to Marx. For Christians, the Bible is a revelation of the perfect will of God. Thus saith the Lord, indicates the final word, which cannot be altered. But Marx said that was oppression at its worst. So that makes sense of, of what's happening with the LGBT movement, with the transgender movement, with all of the protests and the revolutions. Of course, Marx believed that the only way to really get anything done would be to have protests, to have revolutions, to fight the existing order, to destroy class antagonism. So one after another, I'm saying this is Marxism at its worst, or maybe at its best, for those who have been trying to get to work, but the bridge has been blocked because of protest, they can thank Marx. Or if you have a child in a college or university and, and the school is closed because of a protest, you can't get to school, your kid can't get to school, thank Marx for all of the nonsense and for all of the confusion that we see in America. It's terrible. There are so many Christians who don't realize what's going on. And when you tell them, they give you a blank look. What? Where did you get that from? Well, just read a little bit and study. And, of course, look at the Bible, especially Absolutely. Bible prophecy, and you'll know where it's coming from. Absolutely, brother. You've got it right there. Bill Federer wrote a book called Silence Equals Consent. And it mm. talks about what's happened in the United States and around the world, for that matter. And it is something worth reading and considering, and it has a number of the concepts that you have sort of touched on All that right. he's written about. Silence Equals Consent by Bill Federer is available through swrc.com. Larry, one of the things that has struck me during the last term of President Trump, President Trump, one of his State of the Union addresses said, we will never be 
socialist. We will not accept yeah. socialism. And yeah. he made a big statement about that. And I thought, why are you making such a big deal, you know? And boy, <laughs> did I get my eyes opened. And yeah. I started looking at it through the lens of some of the books that we carry and, and some of those that you've written in the past and that others have written. And things that I had written, <laughs> in fact, I'd gone back and read through some of right. them and, and reminded myself of what I had found. And now it is all around us. And yeah. at the time he mentioned it, it was hard to find. Not anymore. <laughs> Not, Not anymore. anymore. He was now, right on. Yeah. What, what in the world happens? You've taught at the university level. I've taught at the university level. What do you do to give grades out for people that are out marching instead of coming to class? Yes. The quality of our students is going down, down, down. I think of something like affirmative action. You know, you may get a D in biology, but because of your skin color, we'll, we'll make you a brain surgeon or we'll make you a <laughs> fighter pilot or whatever. Skin color is no problem with me. I love black people. I pastor a Chinese church. There is a place for merit. You know, the Marxists want to have equal outcome. Okay, everybody's going to be brain surgeons. Everybody's going to be rich. Well, as Americans and Christians, we believe in equal opportunity. There's a difference. Equal outcome is impossible. Equal opportunity is a good thing. There are some people who will work hard. They will exceed in maybe biology or chemistry or physics or whatever. And of course, that's natural that they be promoted. There are some people who are qualified for law enforcement, for preaching, whatever. But the idea that the outcome will be equal, you know, we'll all be rich, we'll all be whatever we want, we can even change our gender. That is absolutely outrageous. And you know, Ken, the thing that has really upset me, I get to speak to a lot of people on the street. There are professing Christians who have no idea what we're talking about. I'm afraid when they vote this next election, they're going to vote for the wrong person out of ignorance, many out of ignorance. Many maybe know the other side, but they hate the other side. They hate somebody who will have a strong position, who will defend the country, who puts America first. There's nothing wrong with America first. I mean, this is a great country. My ancestors, my grandparents came from Italy. My wife came from China. The church I pastor, we have a lot of immigrants from China. Immigrants have made our country great. We've got so many things from them but they have to come legally. Now, it's very interesting. Pastor Victor Samuel in uh, Pakistan, he has a brother who lives outside of Washington, D.C. His name is Wasim. He's a very good man. He has a good job. He is studying to become an American citizen. In other words, next spring, he's going to take a, a test. <laughs> so that's the way to come. You know, it's so simple. We have to know who is coming. They have to know what we believe, they shouldn't be coming here because they want to make this country like their country. If they like their country so much, they need to stay there and leave us alone. Well, that coming from you speaks volumes because I know your life, and I know how often you have helped those who are coming legally to this yeah. country. And I have Tried to do my best as well, as you know, and yes. we have tried to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ so they Amen. may have heaven as their home, not necessarily the United States, but they can have heaven as their home. And that's a very important thing. Now, I wrote a book uh, some time ago called Prayers of the Ancients. That's one of the, the contributions. I think that's probably my best contribution in yeah. writing books. The fact is, it's God's Word and God's Word and more of God's Word. That I loved. I loved writing that book. It took a long time. I was four hours a night for six months. 
writing the right. book. And in those days, I was not on the Internet when I started writing that book. I had to go find books. And boy, I enjoyed that, too. <laughs> that was yeah. great. Well, that book is available through Southwest Radio Church, and I would recommend it. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm the author. Maybe I shouldn't recommend it, but it is an amazing thing what God does for us. The book by Bill Federer, Silence Equals Consent, the book Prayers of the Ancients and the Abraham Proclamation are all available from swrc.com. And we would love for you to get those books and enjoy what you read. It will give you an education. Brother Larry, thank you so much. I I love you dearly. God bless you. I love you dearly in the Lord, and I am so thankful that God has allowed us to work together. Well, the privilege has been mine, and I can just see your smiling face and remember all the good times we had together, Matthew and Timothy and the whole family. Praise God. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. And we end as we began. God is still on the throne, and prayer changes things. Silence Equals Consent, Bill Federer's brand new book, is here. Silence Equals Consent lays out the case that the time is now to speak up or lose your freedom. You look at the chaos all around and you ask yourself, what will happen next? How have godly people been persuaded to let ungodliness reign? In Silence Equals Consent, Bill Federer shows how America's founders were inspired by ancient Israel's covenant government and how this resulted in the U.S. Constitution. In Silence Equals Consent, you'll learn about the rule of tacit admission, Is it scriptural to not care about what kind of country we're leaving to our posterity? In Bill Federer's brand new book, Silence Equals Consent, you'll discover if we're being given one last chance to show what we really believe in our hearts through our words and actions. Silence Equals Consent by Bill Federer. Order your copy today when you call 1-800-652-1144. That's 1-800-652-1144. You can also order Silence Equals Consent on our website, swrc.com. The fate of the world hangs in the balance. Now you are the key to turning things around. The future depends on you. Silence Equals Consent by Bill Federer, 1-800-652-1144. Tomorrow, we begin a brand new series examining how to set the captive free from spiritual oppression and warfare. Be sure to tune in on your favorite radio station by downloading our SWRC mobile app or by subscribing to our daily Watchman on the Wall podcast. Watchman on the Wall is a production of Southwest Radio Ministries and is supported by faithful listeners like you. Visit our website, swrc.com.